such a breath of fresh air to talk to you yesterday because um, I think we both have the same goal of liberation yeah. this, um, and liberation from gender norms with the ability to play with them too. You know, we were talking about polarity. Um, I love to be in a masculine polarity. Um, I have this thing where uh, with, uh, in some of my romantic relationships with women, I feel very masculine and I have like a cowboy hat, I feel like a cowboy and I have this whole thing. It's actually, it's got rhinestones on it, so it's kind of a tiara. Um, and then I can actually play into a feminine polarity. I often do this with straight friends of mine, um, straight male friends, where I'm like a little more femme and a little like softer and um, a little more kind of flirt, like flirty and playful. And for me, um, there's this incredible liberation of being able to move in these different spaces. And I want to talk about the, the, best, the best word in, in the cultural zeitgeist at the moment is toxic masculinity. And it's a tricky word, it's triggering for people. Um, but that's what I've been talking about, is this idea of these harmful assumptions of manliness that are, we know that they're hurting women and girls. That seems to be pretty well established, that women and girls are hurt by this machismo. So are men, not what, just women what, and what, girls. What, yeah, yeah and, that's, that, and that's my point, is that we, we know that it's hurting women and girls. But like, I think that a lot of men aren't, um, aren't able to see how it's hurting them. Um, and so my talk kind of focuses a little bit more on that as a way of having a conversation with men and women too. So it's in the presence of women and we're talking about masculinity and femininity, but talking about how um, this harmful ideas of ma masculinity are actually limiting us and limiting our emotional range, limiting our ability to ask for help, um, to take care of our mental health, this kind of go it alone attitude. It's making us feel like we have to be the breadwinner and if we're not winning the bread, then, then who are we? You know, there's a lot of things that I've investigated around what's harmful in this that's hurting men. And I think if men and women can make common cause about the type of masculinity that's hurting us both, yeah. then it stops being this sort of like men versus women, uh, this, this binary, this, this kind of combative binary. Um, so that's the approach that I've been taking. Yeah. And I mean, um... Like when I was saying it's hurting men as well, I also meant that even if you just look at India, even if you look at um, child sexual violence, it's not just on women or girls, it's on boys as well. And it's, uh, I think the ratio is uh, one in two, which is 50%. That's how high the, the ratio of um, sexual violence on, on children is in our country. And that's not just on little girls, it's also on little boys. And that's not just, uh, of course, it's primarily a, a male thing, but uh, there are women involved as well. So I think this, this whole thing that really needs to be talked about, um, especially in our country, has also got a lot to do with what is man and what is woman. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that um, for the longest time, um, even while we were growing up and we see in our families in India, which is very different than um, the families in America because I lived there 14 years as well and I've lived here so I just feel like there is there is a difference um, in the upbringing uh, of both countries. Where, where were you a child? Where did you grow up? Here. Okay. So I was here for the first 18 years mm -hmm. and then I went to America for 14 years so it was a complete 50-50 of both my growing up years, you know, like my childhood was here, but then from my teens to my 20s to my 30s were like in America, which is like your 20s, you know, where you, your ideas and everything is like forming. So it was really a, a best of kind of both worlds to like sit and observe and um, to figure out where you're coming from and, and then to bring it all back here mm. in your 30s, mm. you know what I mean? So it's like a, it's, it's, it's to notice how uh, when, when you're young in, in India growing up, I think that um, domestic violence is a very big part in every household. Mm. This, this just happens and people just think it's normal. Uh, to the point where when I was performing in a play once and I was talking about you know, domestic violence and all the women just had this smile on their face because it's, uh, it's just, it's rampant. Mm. And it's almost like nobody ever talks about it, but I mean, I think uh, all of us grew up in it, you know. Uh, whereas in in America, you knew that that was not right. 
here, growing up, it was not that you knew that it was not right. It was just like, okay, it's just part of what it is. So just like even beating up a child. Um, in, in India, I don't know any kid who was not beat up um, as, a, as a child. I mean, I was beat up. I, I really don't really um, um, have any angst against my mom or anything. That's just the way it was. And it was fine. I was a naughty child. It's, it's fine. I have no hang-ups about that. But then in America, you can't do that to a child. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So there is a, there is a big gap that also knee is getting bridged now that because the world is becoming smaller and we are you looking at the West and the West is looking at us and you're here and you're having this conversation with me. So I feel like this is a really good time to kind of talk about things like that and get this country into this country and kind of just see both aspects. Otherwise we're just like that frog in a well sitting here and you're just that frog in your well sitting there and you're thinking oh, this is what happens here, and oh, on social media, I saw that that happened. And that's, that's what happens today, right? Like, if you didn't do it on social media, then did it really happen? Yeah, well, I'm so confused. Well, you get certain sensational news stories about countries, about different events, and you sort of like, it paints a certain country with a certain brush, and our, our cultural exchanges aren't really as nuanced. Even though we're getting more information about each other, um, yes. We tend to see, in some senses, we see the worst of each other on social media. Yes, um, it's true. And something that I'm interested in is, what is the best way for me to bring the knowledge that I've developed, especially in America, but also giving talks around the world? Um, typically, like in Australia recently, typically in um, developed countries that, um, that have had a conversation around feminism for, for a, a long period of time, um, I'm, I'm kind of concerned with how can I best be of service in bringing these ideas to the table in a, in a context like the talk that I want to give on the 11th, um, the talk that I will be giving on the 11th. Um, do you have any pointers for me in terms of how to best bring my, because I want to start with obviously my personal experience and the tools that I've learned and the, the, what I, the successes that I've found in this integrated masculine and feminine identity. And I want to offer that with some humility and as a, as a gift that can be of service to people. But I want to make sure that I'm not just, you know, the burner from San Francisco who's telling everyone that they should be just a little more gay and we'll all be happier, <laughs> which is, you know, I... But there's nothing wrong in even that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, I was, you know, there's, there's, a little bit, there's a little bit of um, that message, certainly, in it. But what, how would you recommend showing up in this environment? Um, I, I feel like, anyways, in Bombay, um, where you're giving your talk, I think a lot of us are anyways living that lifestyle. Mm. I, I don't, I mean, if you look at, the other day I saw a Tinder ad and I was like, that's Tinder India, like the ad had nothing to do with the real men that are on Tinder anyways, but you could not probably tell what country that was because that's what I'm saying, mm. that uh, in Bombay, like even if you look at the youth and you compare it to the youth of another country, Everybody dresses the same, everybody talks the same, it's almost like everybody just wants to fit into a mold of same. So we are same, same but different. Mm -hmm. So you coming here is not like, uh, um, I think it's, it's a good thing because it's like a cultural exchange, uh, which is very necessary. It's not the exchange that you would just get on social media. Mm -hmm. It's like when I was young and I used to have pen pals and I used to really love that because it was like, I used to just wait to get that letter and then read about this person and then write back because it was personal interaction. It wasn't um, what we have now, which is on Facebook, where you only, once again, see one side because people just put the good shit. Right? Nobody really. Or it's the shouting, screaming activism. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so uh, it's exactly, it's either this, or it's, wow, I'm having the best time of my life. And hey, you're an asshole. And hey, I'm so great. And yay, you suck. And that's pretty much yeah. it, right? It's like, you need to put someone down to make yourself feel better. And then by putting yourself as good, also you're putting someone else down because you're like, look, I'm better than you because look at the holidays I'm going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's either way, it's like, it's just become such a good and bad. Um, there's no middle ground and there's no truth in it, really. 
Well, and, and, and then ironically, I mean, the way that we'll be promoting this talk is through social media, you know, yeah. so, um, and actually part of my early career was um, promoting festivals through social media. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a, you know, it's making the world a smaller place, it's allowing you to connect in a certain way, but then it's also kind of balkanizing these different groups, you know, in, in my country, I live in San Francisco, um, and uh, when Trump got elected, it blew my mind. Yeah. I was like, wait, wait, how? How did that happen? And it, I had to do a lot of soul searching. I think it blew everyone's mind. Like, oh. it, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't blow half the country's well, mind. Yes, you know, yes. and that's the thing. It, yeah. it 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 blew my mind completely to the point that you know I I I was like researching the white working class Trump voter. You know, like, and actually that was part of my investigation into masculinity too. Is um, you know, when someone has a privilege that is transparent to them, and that privilege is shifted through global forces or through something like affirmative action or whatever, that change in privilege feels like oppression. Yeah. And um, so for the white working class uh, Trump voter, um, especially men who are, you know, we're suffering from an opioid epidemic in my country, a rash of mass shootings. Um, you know, there's a, there have been recent research about this idea of uh, deaths by despair. Yeah. alcoholism, drug overdose, suicide. The mortality rate among um, working class white men in America is actually, um, it's the only uh, mortality rate that's actually getting going up um, for the first time in I don't know how many years. And um, so when we talk about this crisis in masculinity, uh, we're, we have it in the US in a huge yeah. way. Yeah. in an obvious way. And I was just an Australian, you know, the, the suicide rates among young Australian men. Um, it's, another, uh, it's another figure that kind of blows your mind. It's like um, two thirds as many men as women, and it's young men. And um, there's this experience, I think, that men are having um, of alienation. And, um, and these men are in an environment, so to speak to my country, so the feminine is rising, which is a beautiful thing, but men who don't see the feminine in themselves um, this, this feminine is rising and they feel like they're losing space. And um, they don't have the tools to even talk about what's going on with them because of this rejection of emotional literacy. Right. So this is the context that I'm often speaking about. And I wonder, um, I wonder how best to offer that to India. Um, and I'd like to do it in, in the context of kind of a cultural exchange and a fact-finding mission. I'm gonna speak about my experience, then we're gonna do a panel, yeah. which, gosh, I wish you were here for. Yeah. Oh, man, I really wish you were here. But I'll have to come back and do Or something. I'll meet you somewhere. Oh, I'll meet you somewhere. I'm constantly all over the place. Okay. Um, I feel like, I mean, you're going around, I mean, not that I am the authority on anything, uh, and this is not my country, and you're not invading anyone's country, yeah. but um, I just, I just, I just feel like um, I've been noticing, noticing this lately as well. Um, all the retreats, all the talks are all geared on female on female, right? And mm. the point is, I have a female. I know what I'm capable of. When I want to have a conversation, I don't want to just have a conversation to a room of other females. Mm. Because that's not starting a conversation. I want to have a conversation where it's a mix of both people sharing conversation. And that has yet not really happened. Even uh, to a fact where even, if, even a simple thing like yoga, you know, if you, you have a lot of like yoga workshops, you have divine, you know, uh, feminine workshops and there are no men around anywhere and it's it's sad i mean it's really sad because it's just become oh that's like as cliche as it is now oh that's only for women and it's not right and also most of the people teaching that are also women so we need more men to teach these workshops and this is exactly what i was telling you yesterday it's like you know my healing center that i've not really opened to people but these are things that I want to work with. I want to work with men who can have um, workshops for men and women and not just, um, you know, just pitch it towards the divine feminine. This is what I was telling you because if you don't know your masculine, you can't invoke the feminine and vice versa. Really? And, um, um, you know, like, once again, like we were, we were discussing yesterday, it's like the biggest feminist in the world, like I feel, is Shiva, which is 
the first yogi and the biggest belief that you are both in one. There is, I don't, that's why I don't really believe in gender so much and I don't believe I have to really call myself a male or a female. Yes, I was born female, but I have um, a lot of qualities of both and sometimes I go this way and sometimes I go that way. And by qualities, I'm not just, I'm not trying to be cliche where this is a masculine quality and this is a feminine quality. I'm talking about even with biology, like I was telling you yesterday, uh, chemically, I have a uh, high testosterone, uh, that's chemical, so my body does do things which a normal female body could not do. Mm. So this is not getting into the cliches of once again, what is male masculine and what is feminine, you know what I mean? Well, there's one thing you said a little while back that I just want to touch on, which is, I believe you said that you're going to be opening a healing center and you need men to teach workshops, so yes. I just want to put my hat in the ring. I want, to come, I want to come do that. Yes. So just, say, just I don't want to let that go by. Um, when do you have a timeline? Just for the people watching, um, that sounds really intriguing. Do you have a timeline for for when you're opening? Is there anything you want to say about that? Just on a tangent for a moment. I have had it ready for a year and a half. Right. Um, I haven't opened it yet because I just could not find the right way to kind of open it. Mm. Um, so I just talked to this one um, woman. She's a sound healer. And she works a lot with this other guy who teaches yoga. So I thought that's a really good mix of two people bringing two different things um, to the table. So I've, I've just been planning. I, I feel like um, nowadays also there is, uh, like once again with social media, sometimes there's too much talk. And when there's too much talk, people switch off, mm. right? Especially when you're hitting them with a hammer. Like, like, the, like the Mumbai construction? Exactly. <laughs> it's like how much can you can you take of the same thing? Like I was telling you, you know, um, um, a few years ago when I did this music video and I, I did this free hug campaign and oh, yeah, I wore yeah, this, that's a like a dress kind of like this and you know, I I went to, you know, Bandra station where there were like 200 rickshaw drivers and I just stood there with this free hug sign. And they all looked, they were at was first it in, Was like, it in English or was it in um, Hindi? No, no, it was in English uh, and a Hindi subtitle okay. in chase. But the big thing, free hugs, was in English. And um, and they were just like wondering, first of all, like what what is this woman like sitting here doing here? And then they thought, okay, maybe there's a camera. So, okay, they're just doing a shoot or something like this, right? And so then I went up to them because they did, I mean, for them it's such a big difference because like a telling you this classist thing that we have going mm -hmm. in our country like you have the racist thing we have the classist thing and for them their world our world they just look at you and they're like oh different worlds you know and plus if i look at her then they'll just think oh he's just staring at me the bad way and he's an asshole right i mean this is what happens here and so i said okay let me make the first move and let me go out there and give him a hug and i did and i hugged 200 Richard guys that day mm. and uh, not one uh, touched me the wrong way, not mm. one. It was the most beautiful thing ever. And this is seven, eight years ago. I'm not talking about like yesterday. This is seven, eight years ago. So I just believe like even women in, in, in our country were so used to being raised by saying, that, oh, don't go out at night alone. Oh, don't wear clothes like this. Oh, men are bad. Oh, this guy's looking at you means he means he just is bad. So we are, we are so close to positive touch and good touch. There is also good violence, believe it or not. But we are not open to that because in the bedroom, there is such a thing. I mean, people have fetishes and mm. there is such a thing as good Violence. Everything is not bad. This is what I'm saying. It's like, but to even open that whole yeah. Pandora's <laughs> box is like, what? Yeah. Like, what? What? You know what I mean? So let's forget about. Let's not even go about. Go go there. Yeah. We're not just talking about even good touch, because we're so used to walking like this all the time, and so closed that when someone actually comes with a positive frame of mind, it's very difficult for a woman to even see that. 
what, what I love about your perspective in what I've watched about you, what I've read about you and, and meeting you, is that you just have so much compassion and so much clarity in terms of how you treat people. I love the rickshaw story. I feel like that, um, I just feel like in so many environments, we other people. We, we look at people as the other. We, we have stereotypes about them. And we're all afraid. You know, we all have this fear. And so, like, if we can, if we look at all of these men or all men as dangerous, um, then that will somehow keep us safe. And I think that um, that's, that's a really painful thing for men, too, is the experience of being lumped into this, this predator thing. We were talking about this idea of safe, um, you know, consent-based good violence. I think that there's definitely a dynamic around a male fear of being a predator that actually kind of limits our, our sexuality, our sexual expression. Oh, yeah. I mean, and as a woman, it's like it kind of sucks now because men are like, I don't know if I can like, you know, go up to her. Not that men really ever came up to me to ask me out because they were always petrified. But now it's become even worse. Like if you're a single woman, you're just like... Jeez, I've always asked men out for like 25 years. It would just be nice if someone did. But because the dialogue is so difficult now that um, it's very difficult for even men to say, is it okay to flirt? Is it not okay to flirt? Is this good? Is that not good? You know, like it's, it's, it's become weird. It's yeah. really become weird. You know, it's like, and as, as women, even we're like, really confused like uh, like another example i was telling you is like um you know if there is this guy on the road looking at you and you're a woman and all of a sudden you think oh my god he's like looking at me because he wants to do something to me and he's an asshole and we just go off on him and, and we're just like you're an asshole what the fuck are you looking at we never seen a woman before but you know if we just intercut that guy with a cute looking boy then mm. it's okay for that boy to look at me because mm. hey he's cute and he's dressed well but if he's a rickshaw guy and he looks at me like that, that's not okay. So the gaze is the same, but all of a sudden this whole class situation comes into play and then what we think is okay. You know, it's like if someone on the road touches me and we're all like, what the? But then we're in a nightclub and we're grinding with strangers and that's really okay. So I'm also like really confused. It's like sometimes when you're on the road, not everybody is touching you in a bad way. Um, it's It's... Not true, but we're so used to having this, like, you know. And I think that one of the things that happens when men are are grow up being told that they that they're not allowed to cry, that they that they shouldn't show emotions, that they just need to go at it alone, is that we as men don't actually have the language to communicate our our sensitivities. Yes. And so I I, I was giving a talk once, and a man got up to speak, and he talked about how his mother died when he was twelve. And he couldn't cry because he would look weak in the environment he grew up in. So he would just fight kids. Yeah. And if he was fighting someone, he could cry while he was fighting. Mm -hmm. It was such an incredible share in that environment because a sweet man, um, he, if you looked at him while he was speaking, he kind of had a little bit of that like California bro kind of look, you know? Yeah. Um, but so heartfelt, speaking of this deep sensitivity that he had and just nowhere to let it out. And so he'd fight. And I think that when we're talking about consent, you know, the, the language isn't there. Um, the, the techniques to feel sexy and cool while connecting with a woman, it's sort of like, oh my God, what do I do? I'll just grab or I'll just say something. And, and then of course, you know, my, my deep, deep compassion to women who have to deal with those, those flailing and sometimes even you know, obviously violent approaches. Yeah. Um, so for me, this, this work that I'm, that I'm trying to do is certainly not the only work that needs to be done. Of course, there's so much work to be done. But I think talking to men, and what I like to do in my speaking is just to model vulnerability, to be, you know, a pretty, pretty sexy cool guy. You know, like, yeah. I, you know I, got, I, got like, I got like blue toenails, I got like, like hard shaped glasses, and try to model that like there are alternative ways to be a man. And there's, there's ways to kind of get this language and to approach women um, and just trying to have a little more compassion and open a conversation, which is yeah. what I want to do in this talk. And I think that's fantastic. I think a lot of men know that there are different ways of being a man. It's just that they don't have the courage to do that mm. because um, of the cliche of what is a man. Yeah. Uh, the same cliche is what is a woman. You know what I mean? A lot of men um, know that they don't have to be this certain way, uh, but 
a lot of them don't have the courage to break that and go the other way. So I actually have an idea about this. Um, so I was reading an article about advertising to Indian men because in preparation for my talk, I'm just trying to learn as much as I can while I'm here. Um, and the article, I can't remember what was being advertised, but it was um, it was a group that had advertised in India for a long time, and it was kind of the equivalent of the Marlboro oh Man here. And they had um, ads from like the 70s that were like the macho takes what he wants guy. Um, and then they actually shifted and their ads were kind of through advertising, we often we're often our culture is defined. So the the same ads from the same company, well, different ads from the same company, were um, were depicting a different kind of successful Indian man. And what I what I noticed in that is this idea of someone who's tech savvy um, as as a masculinity that's being spoken of as positively in, in India now. And I I can see. I mean, I have a you know I live in close proximity to Silicon Valley, um, and um, I'm close to. Uh, a, very integrated, uh, uh, innovative group of people, people going to Burning Man, and I think that gender fluidity, experimenting with gender, is creative innovation. And I think very innovative people are, um, are often people who are experimenting with their identity too. So I think that there's kind of a way to kind of piggyback off of this like, masculinity is tech savvy, to kind of say that, well, maybe part of being tech savvy, part of being successful in um, in the business world in Silicon Valley and that kind of thing, part of that, maybe we can kind of like sneak in this gender innovation stuff. Because I know from Burning Man that some tech leaders who are making, you know, billionaires are dressing in floppy lady hats and galvanizing yeah. around the desert. So, you know, I mean, I think that that's kind of a, that would be a, a perhaps a helpful model to bring out in this environment. Yeah, I mean, bring it on. <laughs> uh, and, I, and why just Burning Man? I don't know, why can't we just do that all the time? Oh yeah, well, I mean, part of my goal is Burning Man all the time, right? right? <laughs> but we both saying, went, which is hilarious yeah. to me too. Yeah. You, you went in the early days. I went in the, in 90s, the wild west. early 90s, yeah. Gosh. But, um, uh, but yeah, that's exactly, that's what I'm saying. It's like, uh, that's a whole, there are a lot of people here that when they leave their everyday life and they go in a different environment, then they become something else. Mm -hmm. When you come back, you go back to becoming some something else. Yeah. So why can't you just imbibe that in everyday life? You know, I actually have a different talk that I do that I did at a festival in Thailand called Wonder Fruit that was answering that question right. about how to build, how to be your festival identity in the world. And part of that is, is building community and connecting with you know new friends and new environments and and, and really and being a leader in your home life and. I think there's ways to do it, and that's the next talk you need to do then. Well, I, there's so many talk. I just love talking. So just then go, just just sit here and talk. Why yeah. don't you just have a talk show? Um, I pretty much would love to have a talk show. Can would would you be on? I assume you would be on my talk show, right? If I have a talk show. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm working on one myself. Can I be on your talk show? Of course. We'll so we could just have a talk show, like exchange? we are doing right now. Like literally, this could be, <laughs> this could be both of our first talk show. Exactly. Um, and so, speaking of talk shows and talks, these guys better come to your talk. Oh yeah. So um, do you? So people who follow you, um, people who've been excited about your work. I when when we met, there were some um, young dudes who wanted a selfie with you on the street, um, which was great. I wanted to take a self a picture of them getting a selfie of you, um, but I didn't get my camera out in time. Um, you, the people who follow you, the people who are interested in your work, the people who are excited about your upcoming documentary. Um, which I'm excited about too. Uh, we're going to get to watch. We get to watch a little bit of that in a minute. <laughs> um, your your fans, your followers. Um, do you feel like they'd be into a talk like this? Do you feel like this is the type of thing they should attend? Do you feel well, not should, but the type of thing they could benefit from attending? Oh yeah, I mean, I think everyone uh, could always benefit from a talk like that. I think that whether this is once again not geared to just men. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, and totally. I mean, we're going to have women yeah. speaking on this panel. I mean, yeah. it's. That's what's so beautiful too. And if you can get like, you know, it's like, um, this is how you you start the movement, which is what you're doing, and then maybe someone takes the ball from you yeah. and the baton, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then speaks in our language, and spreads it even more, you know, and that's how change happens. Well, um, I mean, the amazing people at Event Special have been so warm to me in producing this event and making it happen. 
Um, and, I, and I think that this is going to be something, we do this event and we've been talking about them being able to continue with events like this. When I'm not able to be here, I'll come back and do it again. Yes. We'll do a video, we'll try to get out there and see, like, you, you never know who's going to pick up what from what you talk about. Yeah. So for me, it's all modeling. It's like, what you say is great, and it's great to me in flow speaking, but also just like, oh, there's a guy who's out there, like, got this kind of androgynous kind of thing, and it's working, and he gets to travel around talking to people, that seems fun. What if I experimented a little bit with my identity? What if I, maybe I can, maybe I don't have to be so afraid of being seen as gay. I mean, I, I, for a long time, I was afraid of being seen as gay. I was like, I'm not gay, just, but now I'm just like, okay. Sometimes I go to a festival, and I'm like, I think I'm just gonna like, have a big gay day today. Just look as gay as I can, I'm just like enjoy Yeah. Myself. And there's nothing wrong with that. Totally, and and that's and that, and that to me is liberation. Yeah. You know, and that's. I, I and that's exactly it. It's like being comfortable in your shoes, whatever that is. Whether you're gay, whether you are not gay, whether you are straight, whether you are straight male, non-gender female, well, or and, and, and these are me, all just words, right? I think that you can totally be a ma a man's man, macho man. That that. That identity, I don't think that is toxic masculinity. And I want to be really clear about that. The, the, the sort of like manly idea of the guy fixing the car, whatever that is, that's not toxic masculinity. To me, what's toxic masculinity? It better not be because right? that's like a wet dream. Yeah, okay, right? Um, yeah, like please, so, <laughs> do so, not so, destroy that yeah, th idea. That, and I think that actually what I found in my life, frankly, is that by bringing in the feminine and, and stop when I let go of trying to be the man who was not a woman, who was the opposite of the feminine, actually my masculinity was so much more grounded that, and so much more real that I actually got more masculine and was more successful in my business. I was more attractive to women. That was like night and day. When I tried, I was in a frat um, in the US, in Southern California, trying to be a man, trying to like, you know, all that. And, and of course, I, everyone could see right through me. You know, women weren't attracted to it because they could see that lack of confidence. And then, you know, went to Burning Man, experimented with, with the way that I dress, and, and just kind of settled more into myself, into who I really am. And to me, that's when the, that's, that's, that opened up the riches. And that's, that's what I want to share. So that's, that's why I'm here. Well, bring it on and share it. Well, thank you. And oh, thank you. Thank you for taking this time. It's been awesome to meet you, awesome to do this video with you. And um, for people who are watching this, this video who may not be familiar with your work, um, where can people find you? What are you most excited about right now? Um, I know you've got a don't lot of things. Don't find me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't you? Don't find don't her. Don't find me in my in my fried edit state. You're about to go Bali though. Yeah, but I mean, I'm still fried. Yeah. Just forgive me. Um, but I think that if you are editing and you are not fried, then you are not I'm editing. Not editing. So, so yeah, so is there anything that right now that you that you want to kind of promote or let people know? I'm, I'm really excited about your documentary. Um, I, I know yeah. that's, that's where, where no one gets to see any of it yet. Um, we don't even get to see um, your legs at the moment. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that's giving it away. It's, um, but yeah, where, where should we point people? We'll, we'll have a link to, to your website. Um, yeah, maybe you just, um, I think that, um, like I said, I was so tired of, uh, yelling and screaming on social media about things that really bothered me that I thought that let me make um, a documentary uh, talking about things that are really important to me and so I feel like when people start to actually approach activism with love mm -hmm. that's when change can come about well you embody that to me and I, I've just met you, and I love your rickshaw story. I think we'll try to get some footage of that to kind of put in this, um, the idea of you, like a picture of you holding the sign, maybe just a picture of you holding the sign, something like that. Um, and I just think that that's, that's what's, that's so important in the conversation, is the compassion that we have for the people who don't have the language to communicate what they need, the people who've grown up in a certain way, and people who are just looking for contact and connection, and, and you know, how can we make a little more love in the world? That's right. Sure. Well, thank you so much for your time, and um, it's so great to know you. Yeah. Aww. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye.